Um, so good afternoon and welcome to the second Healthy Populations Institute Commercial Determinants of Health event. My name is Steve Schott and I am the manager of the Provincial Health Promotion Team within Nova Scotia Health's Mental Health and Addictions Program. I'm also a co-lead of the HBI project, Catalyzing Action on the Commercial Determinants of Health in Atlantic Canada and will be uh, the moderator for today's event. Recognizing and paying respect to the first peoples on whose territories we live, work and study is a vital part of our own ongoing commitment to truth and reconciliation. The Housing University operates in the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq, uh, Wolosique and Pascamati peoples. These sovereign nations hold inherent rights as the original peoples of these lands and we each carry collective obligations under the peace and friendship treaties. Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982 recognizes and affirms Aboriginal and treaty rights in Canada. Dalhousie University also recognizes that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies and contributions have enriched that part of Mi'kma'ki known as Nova Scotia for over 400 years. I have a few housekeeping items to start with. As this is a webinar, you do not have access to a camera or a microphone, but we encourage you to use the Q&A uh, at the top right hand side of your screen to post questions, comments throughout the event. We will also be using the Q&A section to post useful links and towards the end of the session, we'll post a link that will take you to a very brief engagement evaluation form. With this form, we are pulling interest for an Atlantic Canadian CUH uh, email, uh, mailing list via the Healthy Populations Institute and interest in a one day in person CUH event next April or May. Please do take a moment to save this link. Your feedback is a valuable part of this knowledge translation event. We're very pleased to have with, have with us today, Jeff Collin, Professor in Global Health Policy at the University of Edinburgh in the School of Social and Political Science for our second CDOH session, entitled Governance Approaches to Managing Conflict of Interest with Unhealthy Commodity Industries. Our format today is to provide you with a brief overview of HPI and our CDOH project, then to introduce our guest speaker who will then share with us his presentation followed by 15 minutes of, of Q&A. For those not familiar with our organization, the Healthy Populations Institute, HPI, is a multi uh, faculty research institute at Dalhousie Dal University that aims to improve population health and health, health equity in Atlantic Canada and beyond by understanding and influencing the complex conditions that affect the health of communities. HBI has five population health flagship projects with one focused on designing supportive environments for chronic disease prevention. Through this flagship project, we are committed to supporting healthy, active living environments that promote the population's well-being and enhance their ability to reach their full, full potential. This virtual speaker series is part of several engagement sessions across 2024 and 2025 that aims to create a set of recommendations for taking action on the CUH in Atlantic Canada and form a community of practice for stakeholders who are action oriented. I'm delighted to introduce today's guest speaker. Jeff Collins is, is Professor of Global Health Policy at the University of Edinburgh, a political scientist by background. His research centers on the regulation of unhealthy commodity industries and their engagement in health governance. This seeks to develop strategies for managing conflict of interest and promoting policy coherence to address the commercial determinants of health. He is a co-investigator in the Spectrum Research Consortium funded by the UK Prevention Research Partnership, leading its work program on governance for health equity and co-leads ACORDS, a new NIHR global health research group addressing the commercial determinants of health in Sub-Saharan Africa. Jeff's engagement with international organizations includes work on developing approaches to managing conflict of interest and nutrition policy with the WHO, PAHO, and WHO Europe. And he has worked extensively with government agencies and with civil society organizations. Welcome, Professor Jeff Collin, and thank you so much for being here with us today. That's an absolute pleasure, Steve. Um, uh, I'm only embarrassed at having given far too long an introduction yet again. Um, uh, it's all a real pleasure to be here, particularly in the context of what I think is a really um, exciting initiative. Um, can I check, am I on screen or 
I'm going to put you on screen. Okay. And, that's uh, good. So we're side by side, and I'm going to leave in a moment. <laughs> that's good. <here. laughs> okay. Uh, that's good. Um, uh, because this is very much at the limits of my uh, of my technical capacity. Um, but uh, as I said, a pleasure to be part of this initiative, in particular to be in between um, uh, two excellent speakers in Nason and Anna. Um, Anna, in the next session in two weeks' time, will really be um, bringing these issues down to the local level where she's been doing some really excellent work in supporting local authorities to apply what can often be seen really kind of big high level remote um, uh, questions of commercial determinants of health uh, in uh, in real local contexts. And I want to pick up on uh, a few of the points that um, Nason raised in his uh, customarily excellent um, overview of the commercial determinants of health in, in the first session. And I also want to engage with some of the, the really excellent questions um, that were posed there. So if I can just check that I can share my screen. We can see it, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, OK, that's good because I can't. <laughs> there we go. Um, OK. Uh, Sorry. Right, excellent. Um, so over the course of the, the next 30 uh, minutes or so, I want to position contests around conflict of interest as being the defining challenge of taking a commercial determinants of health approach and as, as really representing a key fault line in uh, in health governance, whether we're talking at, uh, at national or global level, and one that's particularly challenging in the context of non-communicable diseases. Uh, and I want to argue that failure about being clear about what we mean about conflict of interest, and in particular about finding ways to reach out um, uh, beyond our kind of echo chamber of the commercial determinants of health community can inhibit the development of strategies uh, to tackle commercial determinants of health when I think we could we could um, find some sometimes surprising allies. I'd suggest we need to more clearly define conflict of interest, to think um, carefully and strategically about how we can advance prevention and management of conflict of interest in policy, advocacy and research. Um, uh, suggest that we've got already got some quite nice tools that have been developed um, in particular domains and which I think can be applied across um, issues and, and levels. Uh, and above all, to, to present um, managing the politics of conflict of interest as really the key challenge to making substantive progress on tackling commercial determinants of health. These are going to vary across issues, across industries and jurisdictions, um, but we can learn lessons from uh, from across these in developing what I hope can be more coherent approaches. Um, I was really struck by uh, one of the questions given to Nason uh, in the first session in particular, which is it was essentially how do we make progress on tackling the commercial determinants of health uh, when uh, the political climate might not be um, might not seem particularly conducive to it. And I was reminded of some work that we did um, in support of um, NGO colleagues in the UK um, a couple of years ago who were re when facing, um, you know, uh, particularly challenging uh, domestic political context. Um, and, and they did some work around essentially, you know, is there value in a commercial determinants of health framework when uh, when you're dealing with um, uh, with you know potentially right wing governments who uh, who are unlikely to be um, to be particularly uh, well disposed towards this kind of language, and I think um, there's some really interesting findings that emerged from this report and which have informed their uh, their subsequent thinking. Um, and I think we do have to remember that familiarity with the commercial determinants of language is far from universal. And that the language remains contested, um, and uh, and I think we we still might want to think about alternative ways of framing these approaches that can appeal um, across a number of of different contexts. You know, we, we it's called the commercial determinants of health by default, really, because it it it's so often been focused on um, uh, on areas that have have often been neglected in uh, in social determinants of health 
approaches, but in, in focusing on the, com the adding the commercial, we've maybe ignored some of the lessons about determinants of health not necessarily being particularly um, user friendly uh, language in in many contexts. Um, that said, I think we are there are also some um, some interesting opportunities that we might want to uh, to think about how we can make more effective use of. Um, I think this is going to be the first time in my career um, that I've spoken positively about the House of Lords. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, they produced a really interesting report about fixing our broken food system. And what was particularly interesting about was the attention they paid to governance questions in this. So the House of Lords said that there's a clear conflict of interest in government engagement with industry during the policy development process. Now, um, if anyone was saying that in the context of the tobacco industry, um, that wouldn't be particularly surprising. Again, you know, one of the real strengths of the tobacco control movement is that it's often been possible to leverage support from uh, from some unlikely bedfellows in, in in ideological terms. But for this language to be used in the context of the food industry, I think is really um, uh, is really interesting and. and uh, and without wanting to kind of exaggerate the, the tipping point analogy too much, it, it does strike me that we, we're at a really interesting moment in some food systems debates where thinking about governance seems to me a prerequisite for um, for tackling um, uh, some key challenges uh, and that we, we might have some opportunities for more progress than we've perhaps counted on. Um, the report goes on to, to require um, those food businesses that derive more than a, a proportion of sales to be determined from less healthy products to be excluded from policy making and for a code of conduct on ministerial and official meetings with food businesses to be employed consistently across all governments departments. So this language of conflict of interest, of transparency, accountability is very similar to what um, uh, countries have uh, have been developing in implementing the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in minimising uh, interactions with the tobacco industry. And I think thinking about what lessons we can learn from that is um, uh, is likely to be helpful. Uh, and it's a particularly important to a commercial determinants of health perspective because as as this paper in the Lancet um, commercial determinants series last year, looking at future directions, um, highlighted so many um, of the uh, of the the key um, next steps in tackling uh, the commercial determinants of health actually centre uh, on taking conflict of interest seriously uh, and. Uh, and taking measures to uh, to manage industry interference, to think more carefully about um, interactions with um, uh, with commercial actors in political, scientific, uh, financial, and other spheres. Um, and yet, this is easier said than done. Um, we only have to look uh, at the World Health Organization, for example, um, to see how often um, it can be very difficult. Uh, for organisations to manage their engagement um, with commercial sector actors appropriately. Um, this uh, slide speaks to um, the uh, the scandal uh, a couple of years ago of a major donation from Nestle um, to initially the COVID-19 fund and then to the new WHO Foundation, um, which freely threw into uh, into sharp relief the fact that this new institution, WHO Foundation, intended to um, uh, to leverage resources from unconventional sources had been developed without paying sufficient attention to conflict of interest. And we've subsequently been doing some work tracing the development of this and thinking about implications for policy. So at the start, um, uh, there were a number of excluded categories that the WHO Foundation wouldn't accept. Uh, funding from, uh, with alcohol, for example, being a clean red line category uh, in the first version of its gift acceptance policy. Now, that red line lasted for all of one month um, uh, to, uh, 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 and then it was alcohol was switched to an orange category that would be considered on a case by case basis. When questions began being asked about this and particular anxieties raised about alcohol, the, concern, uh, the response of the WHO Foundation was simply to delete any reference to alcohol in any um, uh, uh, of their documentation. 
And we can see these kind of challenges as playing out in a number of uh, of contexts, very often in quite acutely in relation to food and alcohol companies. So if we, we look at the role of philanthropy um, uh, in global health, there's some serious conflict of interest questions to be asked about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's major investment in Heineken, the world's second largest beer producer, as well as its longstanding investments and collaboration with Coca-Cola. If we look at climate change, um, the COP27 uh, climate summit was uh, was sponsored by uh, by Coca Cola. Um, the subsequent uh, climate summit was uh, was to be sponsored uh, by an oil company. This suggests we've got some pretty serious thinking to do if we're going to manage conflict of interest effectively and appropriately. And I'd suggest that one of the challenges here is that very often conflict of interest um, uh, is invoked in uh in pretty broad uh pretty crude terms and we and we need to be much more careful about um about articulating which conception of conflict of interest we're focusing on and and we did some work uh looking to differentiate between individual institutional and structural conceptions of conflict of interest so if we look at individual conflict of interest and this is is, is perhaps the most um familiar Individual conflict of interest refers to a set of conditions in which professional judgment concerning a primary interest, such as a patient's welfare or the validity of research, tends to be unduly influenced by a secondary interest, such as financial gain. And we're probably all familiar with some policies and practices um, that revolve around this. So disclosure in scientific journals or a declaration of interests for various meetings for WHO experts uh, or recusal um, from policy discussions where it's seen that um, that we've got uh, as an individual um, a, a clear interest at stake. And while I, I certainly wouldn't suggest that these are unimportant, I think it's nothing like a, an adequate basis um, for decision making. We did some work a couple of years ago looking at uh, the policies of leading UK universities, the Russell Group universities, to how they understood conflict of interest um, in research funding. If, and if you look at their conflict of interest policies, um, the, the level of analysis is uh, explicitly restricted to the individual. So my university is interested in whether I have an investment in Nestle or an investment in Coca-Cola. It doesn't have uh, clear guidance that requires me to consider whether or not the objectives of Nestle or Coca-Cola are compatible with um, our institution. The one exception, of course, here it, it, it is tobacco, uh, where we do have um, a, a, a much stronger policy. But more generally, there's a failure to consider questions about compatibility between research funders and the university's mission. One attempt to uh, to address these kind of issues, not least in the WHO context, is to expand from the individual analogy um, of conflict of interest to to take a more um, institutional um, approach. And here, um, uh, in a, the context of the WHO um, guide for staff, for example, there's talk about how a conflict of interest arises where there's potential for a secondary interest. Um, a vested interest in the outcome of WHO's work to unduly influence uh, or be perceived to unduly influence either independence or objectivity of actions regarding the primary interest of WHO's work. Um, and this is a, a not insignificant step forward, but in practice, it often serves to screen out a lot of the really kind of gnarly, tricky questions and simply to focus attention on uh, on a very narrow range of activity. So, for example, if we take global health partnerships like scaling up nutrition or roll back malaria, here conflict of interest is um, considered, but it's only with reference to the specific activities of the global health partnership rather than um, whether there are broader questions about the compatibility of partners um, uh, with, with global health goals. And we can see the significance of this difference if we look a few years ago at a dispute um, around the Global Fund's decision to give funding to what was then the world's second biggest brewery, SAB Miller, um, uh, around SAB Miller's involvement in a um, an intervention uh, initiative in uh, in South African taverns. 
Um, and the Global Fund denied that there was any conflict of interest uh, in this sense because uh, they saw an alliance of interest in the very narrow um, uh, activities proposed in that initiative. They did actively didn't consider whether there was a conflict of interest between alcohol companies and the objectives of the Global Fund more broadly. Um, more recently, uh, my colleagues May Van Schalwick and, and Nason have been looking um, uh, in the context of firearms and suicide prevention, some pretty extraordinary um, uh, alliances um, that have emerged. Uh, for example, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention um, uh, has taken um, uh, significant money uh, from the National Shooting Sports Federation, um, a, 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 a trade arm body uh, of the arms industry. And even WHO um, has uh, has taken significant money um, uh, in, uh, in comparatively recent years from Syngenta, the pesticide producer, which has significantly served to define WHO's agenda around its approach to pesticide prevention. So we need to have a more expansive understanding uh, and drawing on sociology, I'd suggest that we need a structural understanding of conflict of interest. Um, uh, and this can be quite helpful uh, in, uh, in moving beyond uh, ignore the tendency to ignore inconvenient conflicts, but it also moves beyond questions about motivation or good people or bad people and recognises that um, uh, there are likely to be intrinsic tensions uh, when conflicting spheres of interaction uh, come together and these have got to be proactively managed. And we can think about different ways in which this uh, might be. Now, the most familiar one approach to understand the structural conflict of interest is the idea of a, of a fundamental conflict of interest, as in tobacco control, which I'll speak to in a minute. Um, but more often, there's a tendency to, uh, to perhaps wish away some of the tensions involved in this kind of understanding of conflict of interest, of, of seeing these conflicts of interest as, um, uh, as potentially reconcilable, um, uh, through the idea that partnership can bring about synergies of interest um, or, or or else that conflicts of interest can be contained, isolated and simply shifting attention to islands of common interest um, uh, to, towards identification of, of low hanging fruit. And in practice, this kind of approach tends to privilege dialogue um, uh, over significant action. Um, uh, uh, and, and yet this this remains very significant. If we look at the UN Food System Summit, for example, there was a striking reluctance to consider conflict of interest and then a real trivialising of the significance um, of these questions. Um, a more promising basis for action, I think, is, um, is Article 5.3 of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, which is is prefaced on the idea um, of a conflict of interest with tobacco companies uh, and suggests that um, there needs to be a clear commitment to protecting public health policies from commercial and other vested interests um, of the tobacco industry. Um, uh, and there's a, a whole series of, of commitments um, uh, implied, uh, implied by that. Um, and while um, it's often seen as a, as a major success story, um, uh, in fact, uh, we, we're faced with something of a paradox around Article 5.3. It's described as the backbone of the convention, but has often been peripheral to policy and funding priorities. It's cited as a model for managing conflict of interest with other industries, but implementation is generally weak. Um, uh, and there's also, I, and I think really importantly, a sense within tobacco control and public health more broadly that addressing tobacco industry interference should be simple. But from a governance perspective, we've got to recognise that this is complex and challenging for policymakers, particularly policymakers outside of health, that we're asking them to manage interactions in rather different ways. And we've got to do a much better job um, of supporting them in that. So we did some work thinking about uh, about policy instruments and what kind of um, uh, of, of principles and practices are necessary to support effective measures here. And we we looked at uh, at the Article 5.3 experience um, internationally uh, and tried to identify norms um, uh, uh, that tobacco industry interference should be minimised, rules that parties had to adopt to operationalise those principles, and then to identify substantive tools specifying the practice and mechanisms by which those rules should be implemented. Um, and uh, we, I, I think that 
the success story of Article 5.3 is very much around the norms, the acceptance of a fundamental conflict of interest between public health and tobacco industry interests, and importantly, the translation of that foundational principle into a governance norm that public health policy should be protected from tobacco industry interests, uh, a governance norm that the House of Lords report, for example, is now looking to replicate in other areas. Um, if we move beyond that, there have been, uh, in many countries have developed uh, rules for managing those those interactions around limiting interactions around rejecting partnerships the idea of uh, avoiding conflicts of interest but countries have generally been much um, uh, less impressive when it's come to developing specific tools to help policymakers and government officials in managing those interactions so for example um, we uh, men there's not many places that have done a particularly good job in defining what constitutes necessary interaction with with tobacco companies, and I think the challenge of defining necessary interaction is going to be um, uh, is going to be much more significant in the context of alcohol and particularly food. Um, internationally, there are a number of, of very promising developments that we might draw on in other areas. Um, the starting point for WHO's tool for managing conflicts of interest in nutrition is a very different one for its tobacco control tool in that um, here it, it's very explicitly the idea that we need to establish adequate mechanisms to protect conflicts of interest in the context of moving towards alliances and partnerships with the commercial sector. Um, uh, uh, but uh, and while there are clear kind of tensions involved in that, I think it does provide um, uh, a, a potential step forward for thinking about what constitutes um, uh, appropriate um, intervention. What kind of principles and practices what might we assume to uh, might we develop in order to protect health governance in the context of those widespread political commitments to partnership and multi-stakeholderism. Um, uh, and the Pan American Health Organization developed a, a kind of a variant on that tool uh, around um, principles around actor alignment. Do uh, you know? Do a, a company's interests align with the interests of the Ministry of Health? Um, an engagement profile is the uh, is the interaction appropriate? Has it been well thought through? Are there provisions for transparency, for accountability, um, and assessing risks and benefits? Um, uh, the UNICEF, I think, made a, a really important uh, intervention in, uh, in in seeking to strengthen uh, its terms of engagement with uh, the food and beverage industry, including avoiding all partnerships with ultra processed food and beverage industries, which is is far in advance of anything that WHO has done. Um, uh, and and Canada has uh, has been at the forefront of some of these. Um, discussions uh, as well. Um, I was, you know, struck a few years ago in the development in the context of Canada's food guide um, about the very careful consideration given to ensuring that um, that interactions with uh, the food industry in the development of that guide um, uh, were clearly bounded uh, uh, and um, and restricted um, uh, in in content. The Context is less promising, I think, in alcohol, but um, be, but the, the global alcohol strategy is still somewhat confused um, in its um, uh, approach to interactions with the alcohol industry. But it does in there have something that gets very close to Article 5.3 language around a norm about protection from commercial interests um, uh, that I think um, can be useful. And we are seeing the beginnings of, of good governance principles like this one from the, um, uh, the Institute of Alcohol Studies in the UK about thinking through how we can manage interactions with alcohol industry stakeholders. And actually, there's a lot of tools and resources um, on which we can draw at national level. I think we can make much better use of codes of conduct for government um, officials. Um, uh, and if we've got the, the kind of imagination to draw on authoritative um, sources uh, of, of best practice um, from various UN agencies and other places, then I think we can begin to move towards identifying appropriate forms of, of engagement, decision-making tools and criteria, embedding guidance in operating practices. And I know that Anna will spend um, a good chunk of her presentation um, explaining how those kind of uh, international best practices are being translated into local level action. And finally, I, I just want to pick up on the importance of campaigning in civil society in this space, again, picking up on 
um, on points that were made in Nason's presentation last week. Um, so th th where we've had significant progress on managing conflict of interest at an international level, it's been precisely because of um, civil society organisations choosing to make it a major focus. Um, so the International Code of Breast Marketing substitutes for in very much the kind of the birthplace of global civil society and the FCTC um, have significant measures around conflict of interest because of the actions um, of, of civil society. And there's some really interesting actions taking place internationally, I think, that it might be worth thinking about um, uh, about engaging with. So um, with apologies for choosing an example very close to home, uh, the NCD Alliance in Scotland came together very much around um, uh, around taking a, an idea of conflict of interest as, as fundamental um, to a new cross-party group uh, on integrating the cross-risk factors in Scotland, which has provided a, an opportunity that they've then developed in terms of leading a joint manifesto by 10 leading health char charities to coordinate action across tobacco, alcohol and obesity. And a new report issued last week uh, on, um, on on trying to develop a more co much more coordinated approach to NCD prevention through a wholesale adoption of a commercial determinants of health approach. In Brazil, um, uh, ACT, what was uh, what was then um, one of the leading tobacco control um, uh, NGOs in South America, um, has taken this further by by redefining its own objectives in in becoming a commercial determinants of health organisation. It's it's completely rethought its mandate. So now tobacco control goals sit alongside rather than taking precedence over other health and development um, uh, objectives. And just finally, uh, um, uh, I know that conflict of interest can often seem quite a remote um, uh, and high level concept, if you like. But I think there have been some campaigns which suggest that it can be really helpful in clarifying priorities and bringing in support in uh, into new areas. Um, uh, my one of my favourite organisations is the the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, and they produced a really fabulous series of posters um, uh, a, a year or so ago uh, around the idea of make it make sense, of stop doing things in NCD policies that don't make sense, and allowing food companies to influence policies that regulate products they profit from clearly doesn't uh, doesn't make sense in those kind of terms. I won't um, uh, insult people by attempting uh, to, uh, uh, to speak Portuguese, um, but even I can translate uh, the significance of conflict of interest in this fabulous graphic um, produced by food system uh, advocates uh, in South America. And again, um, the, the what I would emphasize here is that this recognition in advocacy terms of just how much conflict of interest um, implies for a wider food system transformation agenda. Uh, and finally, um, uh, I, I'd mentioned the IMARC campaign in um, uh, in Ireland, who started off with uh, a, a very successful campaign to get uh, the alcohol industry out of educational materials uh, in Ireland. When they found that, that well, those materials were being replaced by gambling industry materials, they didn't say that's not our problem, we're alcohol campaigners. They went after those as well and are now using that as a basis um, for uh, a much broader um, engagement of grassroots and community activists around tackling corporate action. And I think um, taking conflict of interest seriously can, can really be very helpful in thinking about new forms of alliance in, in taking a commercial determinants um, perspective forward. Um, and with that, I'll stop and open this up to questions, if I may. Thank you, Professor Colin. Thanks, Jeff. That was fabulous. And I know uh, we encountered some technical difficulties at the beginning of our uh, webinar, so I, I'm seeing that uh, folks have been able to, to join us, and uh, so welcome. Uh, we have some time for uh, Q&A. Uh, if you weren't able to join us at the beginning, uh, there is a, um, a function at the top of uh, your screen that allows you to use Q&A. Please feel welcome to um, uh, keyboard type in your question and we'll we'll get to it. And uh, so I'm looking we're looking forward to your questions. Uh, 
Um, Jeff, if I may, um, uh, you know, you've already sort of uh, given us a sneak preview of what Anna might be uh, sharing with us. And uh, I I'm just curious from your vantage point, uh, when you uh, apply these kind of international and national uh, sort of best practices and what you're seeing in terms of managing these tensions from a governance perspective, have you seen anything that you can point to uh, without favors, you know, in terms of local action um, in in sort of addressing these dynamics? And uh, uh, so I work for Nova Scotia Health and, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues and myself uh, working at a community level, we're often encountering some of these tensions and don't have all the governance pieces yeah. to go with it. So I'm just curious, like in terms of any advice or counsel you would have for for those of us in sort of public health advocacy and action, working at a community level, uh, you know, absorbing some of this international work and some of this best practice, uh, anything that you can point to in terms of, um, you know, a, a, a positive story in terms of how we deal with this without having all the pieces in, in place? Yeah, so I, I think it's a great question, Steve. Um, I will start just by ducking it and again saying that Anna's going to give a much better answer than than that to me. Um, but I think there's there's a number of things that I'd want to say here and that I think are, are, are maybe worth reflecting on. And again, maybe in the context of the political challenge of how do we engage people with the commercial determinants of health. And sometimes, you know, one of the problems with conflict of interest is that it's called conflict of interest and it sounds obstructive and it sounds awkward uh, and it can sometimes sound moralizing and it can be quite difficult to um to bring in uh colleagues from uh with other interests uh, and other um objectives my, my colleague sharon friel uses the phrase health imperialism um to to suggest that, you know very often in public health we assume that our goals automatically trump those of um uh, of colleagues working in other areas and that's not really a very effective approach to alliance building and sometimes the language of transparency and accountability might be a more effective way of engaging um uh colleagues from uh from other policy contexts because it's very difficult to argue against transparency uh and about accountability and, and and principle you know what we're really talking about here is some pretty basic measures around um uh around around good governance um uh if, if we look at, at article 5.3 of the of the fctc so this sounds like you know a big impressive international treaty and it is a big impressive international treaty but all of the things that are in there were things that began through experiments at national at regional um level uh, and were then in, um uh, 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 and were then adapted i mean very often in uh in uh, in i think particularly in um in local and regional contexts but also in places like universities um you might have a bit of a vacuum around um uh, around these governance issues uh and that can make it seem like an impossible task but vacuums also provide opportunities to be filled and very often it's possible to 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 bring in people with with interests uh and agendas and it doesn't have to require you know a huge um uh a huge production of a six year uh um research program that's going to generate consensus guidelines at the um at the end if you look at canada's food action guide for example it was a one pager it was a we've decided that because of criticism about how we conducted the previous one we're going to respond to that and we're going to keep a record of our interactions with the food industry and we're only going to do it in public we're not going to have meetings behind the doors uh, that doesn't i'm not saying that that's necessarily the most developed approach but it's a significant step forward and i think thinking about these kind of incremental steps that can allow us to change the conversation um just beginning to problematize um uh, these these conversations can be uh, can be really helpful. When I was involved in um, in developing the the WHO tool for managing conflict of interest, um, I got frustrated with some of our colleagues who, you know, with the best of intentions, was were demanding a firewall between the food industry and um, uh, and policy making. And that, you know, that may be a reasonable objective, but but what we really needed at that point was something that legitimated, you know. A poor soul in the Ministry of Health uh, 
uh, in a small island state to have a piece of paper that says it's legitimate to ask questions. What we needed, you know, a shower curtain rather than a fire than a firewall would be a big step forward here. And 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 just thinking about how can we move the conversation forward? How can we begin to problematize partnerships with commercial sector actors that may be um, inappropriate you know if we're involved in things that are uh, that are, are really awkward and uncomfortable from a, a public health perspective can we set in place monitoring and evaluation program um, uh, measures that might allow um, uh, for something better to happen a few years down the line so th so thinking about these kind of incrementally and also you know frankly lots of this isn't particularly complicated the, w the WHO takes 60 pages in its nutrition guidelines to say if to pose a few questions that can be put together on a one page piece of paper and operationalized really pr quite easily i think so um so yeah that was a, a, a slightly kind of rambling a account to say that um uh, that there are things we can draw on and there are certainly things that are being done in a number of local contexts um around the world that that i think um can be drawn upon thank you jeff uh very much welcome. Uh, love the answer, the, the response, and uh, the exploration. Just to remind everyone, uh, you do have an opportunity to ask a question. You can use the Q&A function at the top of the screen uh, to ask questions, and uh, uh, we'll put them to, to Jeff. And uh, in the interim, um, Jeff, uh, uh, we introduce you as a um, uh, as a political science or someone who's trained in political science. And I, I'm curious from that vantage point and whether you said it during your presentation or maybe I've read it somewhere else where uh, something that stuck with me around uh, just remembering, you know, decision makers elected or otherwise, they're going to hold some of these kind of pluralistic viewpoints. They're, they're going to be accountable to the whole population. Their obligation as elected or other officials, public officials, is to listen to the whole community. And, and I, I'm curious in terms of um, your research and maybe just uh, your overall experience in working in, you know, public health advocacy and work, uh, what are the sort of key things that we should remember uh, as advocates, as as community members, and in interacting with uh, with public officials? Anything that you may uh, may run across um, uh, that would be helpful in terms of sorting out interacting with uh, uh, with these entities and uh, and with decision makers uh, as well. Yeah, it's it's a great question, Steve. Um, uh, apologies for answering with an, an anecdote, but we, we were doing a f um, some work in, in Ethiopia a few years ago, looking at um, a, at Article 5.3 implementation, and you know, pretty typically, um, what you find is that there's a few people in the Ministry of Health who are aware of it and try to take notice of it, but nobody else in the government does. And so, what we did was we we went out to other ministries and and we interviewed them, and they weren't aware. Um, but very often people expressed support from really kind of surprising places. So the, in, in Ethiopia, there was an official in the Ministry of Trade who really seized on Article 5.3 as an opportunity for him to manage interactions that he was feeling increasingly kind of pressured about. You know, it's... It, uh, it's not surprising that there's all sorts of people who aren't wildly thrilled about tobacco companies um, making use of trade delegations. I think sometimes it's a question about um, about uh, about problematizing power, about bringing in um, different different voices, um, uh, and and uh, and uh, acting as a as a bit of a check on the the dominance of um, of corporate voices. Uh, and again, you know that. Um, that I think sometimes we get um, we get slightly hung up in public health on a kind of moralizing critique um, of unhealthy commodity industries that I'm as guilty of as anyone. But you know, ultimately, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're they're programmed to maximize shareholder value. Um, my concern is much more with with public health being somewhat naive in it, in its interaction and how how it responds to that. Um, uh, and so, you know, if we recognise that they're behaving as they are, we we can just ask slightly different questions uh, and focus much more on the transparency and the accountability and position this um, as something that. Uh, that's likely to be helpful to um, to government officials. And if you're talking with government officials, if you say that if you adopt this one set of principles and you can use it in a number of different areas, and this is going to 
um, to reduce headaches for you. And it's going to make the management of your next consultation rather easier than it has been um, the previous time. That That's sometimes invoking, you know, uh, arguments around um, uh, around efficiency and accessibility and transparency rather than leading with the evils of industry um, can be helpful in terms of in terms of bringing different people on board. Thanks, Jeff. It, it, it's true. Uh, like I'll share my own little uh, anecdote and uh, uh, I'm always catching myself uh, when I'm engaging or encountering uh, industry involvement in, in our work. Uh, I, <laughs> I go to a default around, oh, so this is just corporate social responsibility in some kind of disguise. And, uh, and so there's a moment where I do need to sort of uh, very much remember uh, how perhaps the rest of the community is thinking about this, how decision makers are seeing this and uh, and just understanding. While the intention may be about that, it may just be marketing in disguise, uh, you know, that may not be the way that it's being perceived by others in, in the community, yeah. including decision makers. Yeah, and I agree. And I think kind of interrogating that, posing questions about that is, is, is also really, um, uh, really important. But um, but you know, I'm, it is one of those things that that I do struggle with. Of course, I've got fairly clear lines on what constitutes appropriate interactions, but there are all sorts of of, of charities and NGOs desperately short of funds who understandably sometimes end up in inappropriate partnerships as a result of that, and and not to be too um, too kind of moralistic about our approach to. Um, to, to thinking about how we can tackle conflicts of interest, um, uh, you know, recognizing that there's no organizations that haven't mis made mistakes on these kind of questions. The important thing is thinking about, you know, how we can learn from them and better support our colleagues moving forward. Jeff, I'm just checking in to see if there's any other questions. Uh, I'm happy to keep chatting with you, which is, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> thrilled to do it. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions just yet. And, uh, uh, you know, it may sound trite, but as as you were finishing sort of that last thought, uh, what was coming to my mind was around the sort of the urgency, the constant urgency around building bridges with, um, you know, sectors that, uh, you know, are, are aligned with sort of general overall public health goals uh, and creating those uh, those opportunities for, you know, an overused word, dialogue and conversation yeah. and, and, and just building those alliances so that, uh, uh, you're building trust. Um, uh, you know, we're often uh, having those conversations with the recreation and sport and physical activity and movement communities around, uh, especially related to food and 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 yeah. uh, how do we work together so that you know we're we're talking, we're thinking about the overall well-being of the population and and um, and again, I'll, I'll allow some of my sort of biases, you know, as being uh, not just. Um, uh, 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 you know, pretext for uh, uh, for marketing gimmicks, right? And uh, and trying to impress decision makers uh, to avoid good, comprehensive public health uh, food policy, right? And uh, uh, so, for me, it's often it's just like keeping the the dialogue and the conversation going, building those bridges, and and uh, and um, and approaching it with maybe some humility as well in terms of understanding where. Where folks are, where other sectors are, maybe in terms of their funding and and uh, um, and you know the challenges that that they may have in accessing whether it's public funding or other other types of funding. Yeah, I, I think that's um, I, I think that that's right. You know, I, I've um, I've had my share of those uncomfortable ones myself. My uh, my two sons played football with the Golden Arches logo because the local branch of McDonald's was the sponsor of their um uh of their uh, their kids football team i'm afraid i didn't do spectacularly well in lobbying to change that but i did at least pose the question and uh and sometimes posing the question is um uh, uh maybe i should have declared that in my conflicts of interest at the start of the session but um uh but but you know, uh, you know join us uh, there there can often be um some real uh kind of tensions about 
uh, about which commercial interests it's appropriate to to problematize. So, you know, very often there might be um, a difference or, or a perceived difference between transnationals, um, where it might uh, corporations where it might be appropriate to question interactions. Um, but in many contexts, policymakers are understandably concerned about about small and medium sized businesses, or even you know um, local businesses that um, uh, that uh, uh, that become be, become bigger companies, but but seem um, kind of uh, uh, tied in there. I think it's also um, we've got to be careful about the the tobacco analogy um, that uh, you know I. It's it's kind of central to my thinking about you know how is it that we we take conflict of interest seriously with with one uh, with one industry but not with others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I would straightforwardly equate the tobacco industry with the alcohol industry uh, with the food industry, and those questions become um, uh, become much more difficult once we move beyond a focus on producers to thinking about. Um, about you know what constitute might constitute the parts of those industry m more broadly understood you know the the retail environment it's very difficult for policymakers to think about uh, about how they manage their interactions with with supermarkets and and, and those kind of businesses and 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 we've got a kind of um, uh, provide tools that can help them to manage those those interactions more appropriately and sometimes that's just going to be about asking questions about whether you know whether a partnership um, between a, a breast cancer organisation and a leading retailer of alcohol is appropriate. We m might not get the questions that or the answers that we always want, but just beginning to to kind of um, pause those and and to think about developing principles and guidance that um, that we can uh, use within with our own, within our own organisations within our our broader movements. You know, very often we we need to do a better job of getting our own house in order first before we start um, before we start telling other organisations what to do as well. Jeff, I know we're going to bump up against time here in a moment, yeah. uh, but we do have a question in the Q and A chat, and uh, uh, so I'll just read it for you, and uh, sure. hopefully uh, we can get it under the the timeline. Uh, your response. So um, here it is. Our current provincial government is, and our current provincial government is uh, led by a progressive conservatives. Uh, we're actually in an election period right now. Um, uh, our current provincial government is very keen. Uh, so this is Nova Scotia, New Brunswick yeah. and EI. Um, so in Nova Scotia, our, our current provincial government is very keen on working with industry, most recently with Nova Nordisk to develop solutions to childhood obesity. This is worrisome. How do we as public health professionals challenge this type of relationship? And I'm assuming uh, Novo, Novo, Novo is an international company out of Denmark, I believe, and uh, and uh, I think has been promulgating these kinds of relationships, uh, uh, perhaps in North America and Canada, but also I think in Europe. And uh, so I'm curious about your thoughts around uh, this question. Um, yeah, it's a massive question and, and hugely um, important. I mean, the, the specific case of Novo Nordisk is, I think, you know, slightly terrifying from a global health perspective about the uh, ability of this um, of this one company based on um, uh, on a, a tiny uh, product range to be redefining um, national, in, international, and regional approaches to tackle obesity and potentially really worrying ways from. Uh, from a prevention and commercial determinants um, perspective, so it, it it is a very real challenge. But the the broader challenge underpinning that is, you know, how do we interrogate um, the uh, the norms around uh, around partnership, around collaboration, around multi stakeholderism? You know, th they're a much better tune than conflicts of interest. Frankly, it, it's it's very hard to argue against partnership uh, and against um uh against collaboration but if we can provide the evidence base for the ineffectiveness of voluntary initiatives of self-regulation if we can position ourselves not not as being anti-business 
um, but as questioning the appropriateness of some forms of interaction, um, then I think that's really helpful. Again, it, it, it's, it's part of the story that gets lost of the tobacco control experience. But you know, the World Health Organization, at the high point of the Washington consensus, was able to develop a treaty which was all about regulating transnational corporations, but did this without being seen as anti-business. Now, that's a hell of a trick to pull off. Um, but it's it, it it is one that we can uh, that we can navigate. I think we've got very similar discussions happening in Scotland, where the um, the government, which has been strong on uh, on alcohol and and food, comparatively speaking, is now very concerned about quotes a new deal for business. But it does recognise that there are some businesses that are different, uh, and that where specific forms of interaction are, um, are going to be necessary, and more more careful engagement is going to be required. And I think um, I think that's that's a really important part of the um, uh, of um, of the story, particularly in the context of approaches to nutrition and obesity. Jeff, thank you. Uh, we're just coming up to the top of our uh, on the east coast of Canada, and uh, uh, we'd like to wrap things up. Um, so thank you, Jeff. Uh, a gentle reminder to click on the Microsoft Forms link uh, that I think is going to be at the top of the chat <laughs> in a moment uh, if you if you haven't already done so. Uh, we'd like to say on behalf of HPI, um, extend a big thank you to all our participants uh, for joining us today and a special thank you to our guest speaker, uh, Professor Jeff Collin. Uh, we like to wish everyone uh, a lovely afternoon and or evening uh, wherever you might be. Thanks everyone. Cheers.